All right, hello and welcome back to Learn the Bible. We are on post 158. This is Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. The title is Sweet Child of Mine. All right, so we're going to see God here continuing his conversation. I mean, the book of Leviticus is a huge conversation where God is doing the talking to Moses. Moses is going to give all this information on to the people of Israel. Now, we've touched on this subject before, but here we're going to see God reintroduce the subject and uh, kind of add to the rules he's talked about before. So there was a horrible practice back in ancient times where there was a false god, and these children, these newborn children, very young children, would be sacrificed in exchange to this false god for protection and prosperity and blessings, which is an awful, awful practice. And the true God, the only true God, the creator of heaven and earth, would have n absolutely nothing to do with this horrible, horrible practice. So anyone who dared to take the life of a child was sentenced to death. They were sentenced to death, and there was literally no uh, mercy shown to them. The people that were in the area, they had to come together and if, whenever they found somebody who was sacrificing their children to this Moloch, to this evil false god, it was the people's responsibility to stone them to death. If, and then the, what's interesting about this beyond, is that God says that if the guy is not killed, God himself will actually turn against that person until the sentence was carried out. God would turn and make that person's life awful until the sentence was carried out. If the people refused to stand up and stone the man who did it, well, guess what? God would cut off not only that man, but the entire family and everyone that supported him. So this is just a very interesting passage. You're going to notice throughout the entire Bible, particularly in the Old Testament of Israel, when there are laws given and enforcement of laws, you're not going to find a police force in ancient Israel. You're not going to find a prison system. You're not going to find a welfare system. You're not going to find anything that's publicly controlled. All of these symptoms, or excuse me, systems, are going to be enforced by the people. They're going to be directed by the people. So you're not going to see somebody where you call the police because somebody's doing something bad. No, if somebody does something bad, you take it to the elders of the city, and then they're the judges, and you tell them your case, and they determine who's right and wrong, and then the sentence is carried out then at the time of sentencing and the people of the town are the ones who carry it out um, and of course the welfare we've talked about before where you had to leave parts of your field open so that those who didn't have anything could go and harvest it so the bible was very unique in that way now as you go through the bible there's also going to be something that stands out to you now god gives us a whole bunch of laws in the old testament a whole bunch of rules that were applied to ancient israel but you're going to see that sometimes there are rules that are given, and it is clear that the things he's talking about greatly offend God. The murder of a child in exchange for a better life, it meant certain death to anyone who dared do it. Those who saw the sin and did nothing about it were just as guilty. If the people failed to do justice, God took the justice into his own hands. It was the people's job. God gave it at... The flood, whenever the flood was over, God said that the blood, of, the blood of people's hands was going to be required. And if a man were to shed another man's blood, by man would his blood be shed. So judgment, or government, was to keep the peace and to carry out justice. So if, that, if this was not accomplished by the people, God would carry out the justice himself. It is incredible the amount of pain and the, the, the death of a child gives gives God that it causes God so we're going to see in the Bible that all murder anytime someone is killed an innocent person is killed was subject to the death penalty and it was always carried out by men but in the case of a child's murder God took the punishment as a personal vendetta he has a very special place and we can see this throughout the Bible God has a very, very special place in his heart for every child. Jesus tells us in the New Testament that the children all have what we call guardian angels, angels 
that are before the face of God all the time. Jesus, you know, the disciples were trying to send the children away because they were tired and they didn't want to bother Jesus. Jesus rebuked them, says, don't send them away, bring them to me, and he blesses them. He has a special place in his heart for them. Psalm 139 tells us that God is personally involved in the creation of every child. And their futures and every amount of their days is intimately known by God. Children are referred to as a gift, a gift from God in Psalm 127. The list goes on and on, but it's clear God desperately loves every human child. So we've spoken before about this practice today that we do. Now, we don't go and sacrifice our newborns to golden statues, but oftentimes we do sacrifice our unborn in order to please this golden statue ourselves, to to improve our lives, because we're not ready to have children. Family planning, we call it. But it's tragic. It's really tragic. From a biblical standpoint, these children are children. They are alive. Again, we've talked about it before. You can go back and check out the post, a few posts earlier. But the destruction of any human life, any innocent human life, is a tragedy. There is no uncertain terms about it. Elective abortion, or abortion just done to improve your lifestyle, or just because you're not ready to have a kid, is wrong. It would be much better if you prevented yourself from getting into a position where you'd have to consider it. Wait until marriage to have sexual relations and bring forth children. That was clear in the Old Testament. That's clear in the New Testament. But the question that's going to leave us is where does this exact rule leave the 62 million Americans, plus say more than 62 million now, who have had abortions in the past 50 years? How about the hundreds of millions of abortions that have happened around the world? Some forced by governments, like in China. The fact is, from the biblical standpoint, the murder of a child, born or unborn, is a sin, and you have shed innocent blood. There are now, again, as I mentioned before, there are occasional abortions that are done because of dangers to the health of the mother, that are done because of dangers to the child, because there's some deformity, um, there's, there are exceptions to when they're medically necessary, but lifestyle improvement is not medically necessary. So excluding those rare exemptions, elective abortion is just wrong. But I'm going to tell you something which may sound a little weird. I don't mourn for the loss of all those children. I know there's something better for them. There's something that gives me great relief. I know what's greater than all the sin, including the sin of abortion. What's greater is the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ lets us know that all sin can be forgiven. Jesus received these children into his hands. I know that. The Bible's very clear on that. The blood of Jesus Christ can forgive any sin, no matter what you have done. I am sure that somebody who will hear this message will have had an elective abortion performed. Maybe you're a physician who performs them. So I am not here to tell you that there is no forgiveness of sin. There is forgiveness of the worst sins, and they're recorded for us in the Bible. That's the most amazing thing, because the one thing that will never be greater than... You, the one thing that will never be... Uh, uh, the one thing that will, excuse me, the one thing that will always be greater than your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, it forgave a man, there was a man who committed adultery. He slept with another man's wife. Worse than that, it was his friend's wife. And then when she became pregnant, he had that man killed. He had that man killed. And although this man named King David paid a great price for that, for that sin, he was still forgiven by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is more powerful than our sin. That's how powerful the blood of Christ is. David is still to this day called a man after God's own heart. You can be forgiven. There was another man that the blood of Christ forgave. This man made it his life's work, his deepest devotion, to hunt down and capture Christians and, and lead them to their death, to get them to be murdered. But then the blood of Christ transformed this man into one of the greatest evangelists of all time. 
He still dealt with the guilt of what he had done. He writes about it in his letters because he wrote the majority of our New Testament. And we strive to be like Paul. Not like Saul of Tarsus, his old name, but like Paul. Because the blood of Christ is more powerful than all of his sins. And every child that's lost to abortion is received into the hands of our Savior. And if you've ever received one, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you one else. I am here to share with you not the evil of our actions, all the sins we commit. I'm here to tell you the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You confess your sin to God and you accept the blood of Jesus Christ and you let go of your guilt. It was paid for. You are forgiven. And you will meet your child again one day. And it's not going to be a, oh, I've done a horrible thing. No, it's going to be a joyful reunion. That child bypassed a lot of the hardships that we face here on earth and gets to enjoy an eternity in heaven. That's the life they've known. So that is a fantastic thing. And they're looking forward to meeting you. So I pray that you have accepted what Jesus Christ did for you. There is no sin on the planet that is greater than the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the most powerful force in the universe. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You can never, ever, ever commit any sin that's going to exclude you from the love of Christ. Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But you have to accept him before it's too late. And one day it will be too late. When you have died and this life is over, it will be too late. So take right now, if you haven't done it yet, get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ. Confess your sins, receive what he did for you on the cross, and give your life to him. There's an old song that I really like. I'm not going to sing it because I have a terrible singing voice. But it means a lot to me because of the things I've done in my past. I've done a lot of evil things. But the song says, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that can pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. God bless you. I pray that you've received that grace. If you don't know how, if you're confused, if you're wondering, call me, text me, message me. I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. Find someone, find a believer. There's no magic to this. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. All you have to do is receive that payment and accept his sacrifice for you. God bless you. It was wonderful to talk with you. Have a great day.